rise from the ashes like a phoenix. The ashes. The burned out forests. New plants will arise from a burned out forest. They will grow and they will create a whole new biome. Well, not a whole new biome so much as just a whole... Maybe? What if it's a different community that rises? What if the forest you burned is not the next forest you get? Do forests always follow the same paths? These are some of the questions that we asked. When studying divert disturbance in succession, do the same forests always arise given the same initial conditions? Random effects may or may not cause them to do so. But disturbance, disturbance is a fact of life. Be it a hurricane, earthquake, landslide, forest fire, oil spill, or just someone mowing the lawn. Disturbance is a fact of life, and succession is what happens when new organisms colonize. In this lecture, we're going to define disturbance. The non-equilibrium model, the intermediate disturbance hypothesis, the climax community, and succession. We'll relate disturbances and succession to biodiversity, and relate disturbance to competition and niches. We'll define primary and secondary succession, and we'll start again in the mouth. Succession. The mouth is a biome. You know what would be a better one for this, though? Let's start with a bit different one. How about cavities? Every time you brush your teeth, you're going to start over a succession. Brushing the teeth is a disturbance. We don't cover candidiasis. Ah, whatever. Brushing your teeth is a disturbance. New bacteria will colonize the teeth, and they'll change the habitat in such a way that other bacteria can colonize that habitat. These other bacteria may be able to actually burrow into the teeth, making a new habitat, which can then be taken by new bacteria, which can burrow even further, which exposes pulp, which is a new habitat, the new bacteria, you get the idea. Eventually it kills toothache, kill Jacob Marley. But really it's a matter of succession, and it's stopped every time that you brush your teeth. Every time you brush your teeth, you just reset the clock to how long before you die of some massive toothache and infection. Great thought. What about a tree? If a tree falls in the wood, does a biologist study it? Of course. What we do, we study everything. It's a disturbance when a tree falls. New light is opened up on the forest floor. New soil is opened up on the forest floor. New niches are opened up in the forest whenever a tree falls in the woods. But what if they don't fall? Or what if they only fall very rarely? Then you get something called a climax community. Now, I read students writing about this. Let me just first I'll say, it's called a climax community. It is not called a community that is climaxing. Just, just, just no, just, just no. Anyway, a climax community, the idea there is it's stable. Minimal, if any, disturbances. It's controlled solely by climate. It's an idea. It's a hypothesis that there is kind of this end goal. There's always this end goal for a certain community. So let's say I just, you know, double thanos it. All of humanity is gone. What would happen here? Well, it would probably be dominated very quickly by your, you know, Big leaf maple, aspens, uh, sorry, poplars, and dug fir, followed by um, hemlocks, red cedar, and then more hemlocks, more red cedar, perhaps some Sitka spruce moving in, and eventually probably a Sitka spruce, red cedar, and hemlock forest would be what exists here. Is that the climax community? It's be controlled solely by climate. It'd be relatively stable. If a, if a red cedar fell, it might be replaced by a Sitka spruce, or a Sitka spruce fell, it might be replaced by a red cedar, but generally the climax community would stay the same. It's stable overall. But non-equilibrium is a different model. Most communities are actually changing. Would that forest really remain the same? Well, no, disease happens, fire happens, herbivory happens, outbreaks happen. That there is this kind of dynamic non-equilibrium where communities move back and forth through and to different climax communities and between different climax communities. 
So non-equilibrium is more that things are dynamic, that there are fires, that there are hurricanes, and that things kind of change from one climax community, perhaps things get reset, or maybe to an earlier stage, and then go to a different climax community, or maybe to the same one, that they are taking different paths, and they can even switch between communities. So non-equilibrium is much more of a dynamic hypothesis. Now there is disturbance, but the rate of disturbance really does matter here as well. And I love this experiment. Oh, I love this experiment. This is just really well done. Sometimes you just gotta get that cheap, dirty science. So you have this biologist, and he wants to measure what if there was constant disturbance, or occasional disturbance, or rare disturbance. Well, he looked at this wave-torn, rocky shore. And he said, okay, you know what's really constantly disturbed? Small rocks. They're being knocked around all the time. So the part of the rock that is exposed to sunlight and water changes every year as the, these rocks get tossed about in the heavy winter storms. So that is a rock under nearly constant disturbance. Well, bigger rocks are really going to be occasionally disturbed. And rare disturbance are the boldest of the rocks, you know, the bolder ones. Well, how do I know how big a rock is? Well, I mean, you can always measure the rock, but easier way, how do I know how resistant it is to being moved over? That was the real question. How resistant is this rock to being moved? Well, what you do is you move the rock. Well, I mean, he's not out there <coughs> pushing the rocks, no. He got his truck, and he tied it to each rock with a, so a way of measuring how much pull was made. And he used his truck to pull the rocks till they tumbled over. That's how much disturbance it takes. Before he did this, he measured what the community was on the rock, and he could predict the biodiversity of the community based on or he could predict how heavy the rock would be based on the diversity of the community on it. Because the biggest rocks are going to be the ones that are going to have, you thought, the highest diversity. You're wrong. They don't have the highest diversity. The highest diversity is in the occasionally disturbed rocks. And here's why. It's called the intermediate disturbance model. Or hypothesis. Think it over. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take St. Martin's Lawn, big spot out there, every year, I'm going to burn it. And then every summer, I'll do it again. I'll burn it again. You know what? I'm going to burn it twice a year. Every spring and every fall, I'll do it again. Yeah, I'll keep burning it. That's going to be a high disturbance community. What you're going to have is the index of disturbance is high, maybe close to two. Very few things are going to be able to grow if the disturbance is very high. Only these really fast-growing weeds are going to be able to grow and set seed and survive high levels of disturbance. What if I build a wall around it? Build the wall, build it 100 feet tall so it protects against wind. Have drainage so it's not like a big bucket after a while, but um, it protects against wind and um, put a net over the top so it protects against new, like, new insects or invasive species coming in. But it still has sunlight. It'll never be disturbed again. After a while, that would be a very specialized niche. And eventually there'd be very few taxa living there because it's a niche. Eventually, one species will reproduce more than others. It'll occupy the niche perfectly. So eventually, they'll I'll look in there, it's nothing but Sitka spruce because that is the thing that can occupy that niche. So again, the species diversity is very low. But what if there's the occasional forest fire? What if there's the occasional earthquake, occasional blight, occasional flood? What will happen is the occasional disturbance won't kill everything of a single species. It'll allow some of those species that can really rush in and grab the new land to stay alive because there's always a little new land. It'll allow some of those species that can survive a long time and wait for that really long climax community to live because they don't always get knocked out every time because it's not a super disturbance. So the intermediate disturbance hypothesis is the idea that somewhere in between just the right amount of disturbance leads to the highest biodiversity. 
those organisms that can like disturbance and those organisms that detest it can both live if there's not a lot of disturbance. The movement towards a less diverse community is known as succession. Well, not less diverse, sorry. A new community. Movement towards a climax community. Let's say there is a disturbance, a fire. One year after a fire, certain plants will come in. It's like fireweed, lupins, will, will come in. 25 years later, you have more plants. So these aren't the same plants. You have a bunch of grasses, lupins, fireweeds, and then a bunch of trees. And then after those will be different tree species. Succession is going to be the, um, the natural one species, another species, another species, another species comes in. It ends up in what's called the, the old growth. Succession is slow or non-existent. Look at campus forests and then go to whole rainforest, well, when you can, or go to the old growth forest near Mount Rainier. You notice it's biodiverse because there still is disturbance. There still are tree falls, but it's not super biodiverse. It's, sorry, it's biodiverse. There are still tree falls. It's not a complete, fully successful, I'm sorry, that. It's not the most biodiverse it could be because you don't have intermediate disturbances. These are very few disturbances. Compare with your campus forests where there was a disturbance basically mowing uh, 80 years ago. There are two types of succession, primary and secondary. Primary and secondary Sorry, primary succession, bare rock. Starts out with bare rock. A glacier comes in, brrr, there's nothing but bare rock. Primary succession is slow. Lichens have to, dissol have to dissolve the rock and form a small biomat. Then dust gets caught in the lichens. Then small little weeds can grow in the dust. And they die, and the dust accumulates to make soil, finally, a little bit of soil. Small plants can live in the soil. This plants die, the soil deepens bit by bit by incremental bit until the soil is finally deep enough to have small stunted trees, which it takes a long time to move from primary succession all the way to a big majestic old growth forest, which is why those who said that most of the earth was covered by glaciers 4,000 years ago really don't know primary succession very well. If all glaciers existed 4,000 years ago, then Siberia wouldn't have time to become Siberia. It wouldn't have time to become such a beautiful place. No, secondary succession is another thing. It leads to soil. So there's still soil, and a lot of things can grow in the soil. Maybe the seed bank is cooked, but seeds can come in from elsewhere, and they can get into the soil, and they can survive there. So secondary succession is often faster than primary succession. So what does primary succession look like? Well, we've got some good examples, thanks to all the melting of glaciers. This would be Glacier Bay, now known as significantly fewer glaciers bay. Up here near the top, you'll see this pioneer stage where fireweed and other small weeds are going to be able to get into the rocky soil, sorry, the rocky substrate, not soil, rocky substrate. Uh, the driest stage is followed by these small plants. These are a little, sorry, rose-like plant that can grow in small bits of soil then you get the spruce out uh, to the alder stage. Alders add nitrogen to the soil and a lot of decaying biomass. And last, the spruce stage. You also want to think of something with competition. What's a better competitor, spruce or a pioneer plant? Spruce. They're bigger, they're taller, they'll shade out the other plants. Remember from um, Growth of Life on Earth, the spruce are eventually going to shade out the smaller plants and they're better competitors, so that's why they eventually go through these stages. Kind of cool. Uh, mosses are some of the first pioneers just like they are the first pioneers back in the beginning with life on Earth. Man, you can really build the connections here. This would be a great time for like the rest of this lecture, just be all the different connections between all of them, but let's face it, that's a lot more to get the students to build the connections. Look back to the growth of plants on Earth and look back to competition. You're going to see succession really follows a lot of that. Yeah. little secret. We're going to eventually colonize the moon. 
That's primary succession. There are scientists currently working very hard to come up with crops that can grow on the moon. Ah, ah. Pioneer plants! Pioneer plants on the moon, guys! Find a plant that can grow on that lunar substrate. And that will begin primary succession. Like, that, Bodhi, Bodhi, that, that takes too long. Yeah, well, we got greenhouses. We can kind of ramp it up a little bit. We can add nitrogen in the form of, um, well, urine. So we can add nitrogen to make the primary succession move faster towards crops. Crops aren't the spruce stage. Crops are like between pioneer and dryas stage. So getting crops on the moon requires some pioneer plants. And as of last Friday, I finished writing a grant proposal saying that how we're going to fertilize them. Um, I worked on this grant proposal with Dr. Smalley, Dr. Brandy Fox, and uh, Off Planet Research to think about using this primary succession model when we colonize our next planet. So see, you can use this kind of stuff, even in engineering. Anyway, short lecture, cool stuff. Next one, next one's gonna be the last lecture. We're gonna see how this goes. It's gonna be a little less notes. Hey, hope you all are keeping safe and healthy. Um, I heard today that Donald Trump says by April 12th, we'll all be back in service. So you might not even need to watch this lecture. Ha ha, looking forward, great at, looking great. Looking forward to it. Let's find out. You'll know, I don't, because I'm in the past.